This episode of Yesterworld is sponsored by Verve. Stay tuned after the video to learn about their content, including Nick Splat, Boomerang, and their new animated series, Genlock. Just go to vrv.co slash yesterworld to begin your 30-day free trial. Of all the attractions to leave the Disney theme parks and enter Yesterworld, Maelstrom easily ranks as one of the most difficult to talk about. But while the ride no longer exists today, its history and development is full of unrealized ideas, abandoned effects, and a touch of mystery, and the story of Epcot's original thrill ride is a story certainly worth telling. Welcome to this very special place, Epcot Center. Walt Disney's greatest dream is now a reality. To fully explore the origins and history of Maelstrom and the Norway Pavilion, we have to go back to the opening of Epcot in 1982. Originally, the park opened with nine countries in the World Showcase, but in between these pavilions were ten vacant plots of land for even more countries in the future. If visitors were curious about what exactly these future countries would be, they could take a look at their complimentary brochure advertising the next four as part of the Phase 2 construction of Epcot. In fact, you could even find literal signs within the World Showcase highlighting these future pavilions, and back then it was pretty easy to see the empty plots of land they would eventually go into. Now, exploring the other planned countries and attractions is another topic for another episode, because our focus was the already partially built at the time Denmark Pavilion. Now you might be thinking, Mark, there was never a Denmark Pavilion, but that's where you'd be mistaken. Kind of. Just a few years before the park opened, Disney was in talks with the country of Denmark to represent a pavilion for the World Showcase, and it was pretty much set in stone by the park's opening. But there's a reason why it wasn't included on the list of planned future countries. Unlike Morocco, which would become a reality in the World Showcase's 10th pavilion, technically Denmark was already under construction when the park opened. Mm, kind of. If you visited the World Showcase in 1982, you might have understandably passed by these bathrooms without batting an eye. But on closer inspection, you'd realize they were designed with Danish architecture, as the restrooms were planned as part of the upcoming pavilion. However, by 1983, plans were changed when it was decided to feature more than just Denmark, but Sweden and Norway as well within a much larger Scandinavian pavilion. Unfortunately, of the three countries, Norway was the only one to acquire the necessary funding, but the name of the region would still be included in its title, Norway, Gateway to Scandinavia. And to the site where the great kingdom of Norway will soon become the 11th country to be represented among our community of nations. And what a country it is. It wasn't long before Imagineers got to work on the Norway Pavilion and its signature, albeit now smaller scale attraction, Sea Venture. To authentically capture the aesthetics of Norway, the Imagineering team was sent to Norway to explore the country's architecture, landscapes, and cultural heritage. And in addition to Imagineers like Paul Torgino and Bob Kurzweil, Sea Venture was one of the first attractions to involve the now legendary Imagineer, Joe Rohde. One of my favorite Kittleson uh, paintings is this one. Um, of the uh, Nuken, which is, a, we would call it a water troll, a, a, a thing that lives in the water. We wanted to feature this. It's real mysterious, real kind of uh, creepy, uh, but thrilling, and yet somehow poetic. Sea Venture was to be Epcot's first true thrill ride, taking visitors on a magical journey inspired by Norwegian folktales, myths, and legends. As initially envisioned, the journey began with visitors surrounded by a mystical forest where they boarded ships designed after Viking longboats. But other than just a fantasy troll story, specifics are a little vague, but one description given was, quote, taking the form of a journey through mystical lands and trolls to find the Rainbow Bridge of Valhalla. From the very beginning, it was planned to have the vessel travel both forwards and backwards, as it was something that had never been done before in a flume ride-based attraction. It would also be the first dark ride to utilize audio animatronics and a black light setting. The attraction would also include a catchy musical theme by the immensely talented Sherman Brothers. This went as far as having the dynamic duo visit the workshop, and after being pitched the story and shown various concepts, fell in love with the idea and left to go write the song. 
Eventually, the heads of the Norwegian companies who were sponsoring the attraction and pavilion were flown down to check up on their investment. To the Imagineer's delight, they loved Sea Venture's concept of a boat ride through Norway, but that's about it. In the words of Imagineer Paul Torrigino, they wanted, quote, more of a travelogue showing all the different things that make Norway unique. Vikings, a fishing village, polar bears, a fjord, an oil rig, and maybe a troll or two. The ride's concept had to start again from scratch. To make matters worse, it's rumored that the Sherman brothers had already come up with a theme and possibly a demo, but sadly, they now had to be let go from the project. Eventually, Imagineers came up with a bit of a compromise between the two visions for the ride. Through the use of a vague plot mechanic involving time travel, they could include all the elements the sponsors wanted to represent Norway, and squeeze in a few of the fantasy elements as well. So in 1986, construction officially began on the 11th official country for the World Showcase, with both the attraction still known as Sea Venture and the pavilion itself slated to open in June of 1988, just in time for summer. Sometimes I like to close my eyes and imagine what it'd be like when summer does come. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what you call foreshadowing. And now the flag of Norway will be planted, officially claiming this site for the Norway Pavilion. It may be hard to imagine today, but in Epcot's early years, the World Showcase had a tour slash transportation vehicle, and if you rode on top, you got an amazing view of Norway's construction. But in May of 1988, that was no longer needed, as the streets, shops, and restaurants were open to visitors during the soft opening of the pavilion. This included a playground themed around a Viking longboat. Now, as I keep mentioning, Norway's attraction was initially called Sea Venture, and the sign could even be seen during the pavilion soft opening. However, perhaps to avoid confusion with the recently opened Living Seas, the name was eventually changed to Maelstrom. But while the ride was supposed to have a soft opening alongside the pavilion, technical difficulties put the attraction behind schedule. So much so that in Blink You Might Miss It promotional videos, footage of one of the attraction's effects to promote the upcoming ride was taken while still at Disney's workshop. But the ride would miss more than just its planned soft opening, but its planned official opening date of June. What made this slightly problematic is that Maelstrom's dedication ceremony was to be a televised event on June 3rd, in which the Prince of Norway himself would announce the pavilion and attraction as officially open. Some believe this was supposed to air in the US as well, but since the ride still wasn't ready, it was only televised in Norway. It is my hope that the pavilion will not only be a pleasant and interesting attraction for visitors, but that it will contribute to wider knowledge of an interest in Norwegian culture, history, and modern life. Ladies and gentlemen, wishing the best of luck to Disney World, I hereby declare the Norway Pavilion open. The delay of Maelstrom was covered in the papers, but at the time, no one knew exactly what the cause was, but you'll find out soon enough. As a month later, on July 5th, 1988, Maelstrom was finally open to the public, and judging by the attraction's marketing, this was going to be one heck of a wild ride. And Webster defines Maelstrom as a powerful, often violent whirlpool, sucking in objects within a given radius. To ride or not to ride? That is the question. I have the answer. No, I'm not riding. You ride. Good luck, guys. Here we go. <laughs> The ride began at a beautiful mural that featured aspects of Norwegian culture, and after boarding the Viking longboat, your journey was officially underway. In the first scene, you were surrounded in complete darkness as you began climbing up a waterfall. You are not the first to pass this way, nor shall you be the last. As inspired by Norse mythology, suddenly a powerful gaze illuminated from Odin's eye, and he began telling you the origins of Norway. After climbing the waterfall, you found yourself in a village, with the following scene showing longboats departing into the sea, where a viking blew his horn. There are those who see Norway's spirit veil in a land of forests and mystery, where trolls still prowl the water's edge. You then came face to face with a very unfriendly three-headed troll in a Nikon, in a scene that initially contained the largest smoke machines within any Disney attraction to date. But what's funny about this iconic Maelstrom photo is that there's literally nothing for guests to even be looking at. Or is there? 
The troll then puts a spell on you that causes the sky to light up as you are cast away from the scene. Now, this is troll country! The Hawaii Beacon! I'll cast the spell! Yes! Yes! You disappear! 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 Back! Back! Over the park! Though difficult to see given the speed and direction, you would actually pass by another troll on your right with unsubtle yet beautiful scenery, but the troll's snarl was often difficult to hear. Before recorded time, Norway's spirit roamed the seas of the far north and beyond. After passing by adorable puffins and polar bears, if you were to look behind you, you might think you were about to go over the waterfall you saw at the attraction's entrance. But as you're about to go over, another troll appears. Now we come to the most controversial aspect, second most controversial aspect of this entire story, but it needs a little context. When Imagineers were struggling to balance their vision of a fantasy thrill ride and the sponsor's Norway travelogue approach, they had a stroke of genius. Imagineers took the sponsor's rather bland idea of traveling by an oil rig and designed it to be one of the most intense show scenes of the entire attraction and Epcot as a whole. After going down the final drop, you'd find yourself in a terrible storm that would utilize powerful wind machines, sprinklers, and this. Seen here is a massive Tesla coil specifically designed for the ride to simulate lightning, and no, I'm not exaggerating or using another image as a substitute. The scene was initially so intense and extreme that by the end, riders were left completely drenched. Allegedly, there was also an incident where a reporter attending the grand opening but not really grand opening fell out of a boat and into the water. This helps make sense why Disney initially advertised Maelstrom as Epcot's new thriller. What makes this controversial is that no one can really agree on exactly when these effects were abandoned or at the very least tremendously scaled back. Obviously, the wind and rain can be seen in early promos, with many saying that when the ride opened, ponchos were in fact made available to guests, but there's no flashes from the Tesla coil. Early ride footage shows the Tesla coil in action, and the flashes of electricity are pretty obvious, but no real wind or rain and a serious lack of ponchos. In later years, evidence of these effects were discovered in the form of what seemed to be sprinklers and vents used for the wind. The common belief is that Disney, either right before officially opening or very shortly after, realized that pouring water on visitors alongside a giant Tesla coil probably wasn't the safest idea. However, regardless of the truth, from the storm scene you reach the end of the ride and enter the seaside village. Your base has always been the always be adventure. After exiting the boat, you were held in a group behind a set of closed doors, and once opened, you'd enter the theater and view the 70mm 6-minute film, The Spirit of Norway. Our spirit, it lives in our people. Within just one year of opening, tourism to Norway had increased by a reported 500 to 700 percent, but the companies sponsoring the attraction saw much less of a return on their investment. So in 1992, they sold their stake back to Disney, but the Norwegian government was happy to take their place and fund the attraction and pavilion themselves. Over the years of its operation, not much changed within the attraction. However, by the 90s, Maelstrom had seen a few alterations since its debut. Various lighting effects were improved the fog and smoke effects were drastically reduced, and the giant Tesla coil in the storm scene had long since been replaced by a strobe effect. By 2002, the initial tourism boost to Norway had faded, and the country's government opted not to renew its sponsorship going forward. Much like the Wonders of Life pavilion, without a sponsor, Disney would now have to financially support the pavilion and attraction themselves. Eventually, the doors to the theater, showing the now incredibly outdated spirit of Norway, were left permanently opened, allowing visitors to watch the film or leave the theater at their leisure, if it ran at all. In 2008, the Viking playground was demolished, allegedly due to safety concerns, but traces could still be found for many years. As far as the ride itself, Maelstrom was left alone and the attraction still exists today. Thanks for watching, subscribe, like, and I'll see you next time on Yesterworld. You want to hear the rest of the story, don't you? Okay. 
In 2013, Disney released a tiny, low-budget film you may have heard of called Frozen. Despite making virtually nothing at the box office, for some reason Disney began implementing the hardly popular characters into the parks. Who am I kidding, it was a worldwide phenomenon and honestly a pretty spectacular Disney film. This is the best day of my life, and quite possibly the last. However, the true beginning of the end for Maelstrom began as a test, when an Anna and Elsa meet and greet was featured in Norway that saw massive wait times of up to four to five hours daily. Amid speculation, or concerns for some, that Frozen might replace Maelstrom, the next year an article was published how Disney was in no hurry to make a Frozen attraction. Three months later, Disney officially announced a Frozen attraction, and fans of Maelstrom weren't too happy to say the least, and the ride saw its last voyage on October 5th of 2015. You might not be the first to pass this way, but you will certainly be blessed. Work soon began on transforming the attraction into Frozen Ever After, which unfortunately included the removal of the iconic waterfall that gave visitors a glimpse into the ride. But in June of 2016, ironically the same month that Maelstrom was supposed to open almost 30 years earlier, Frozen Ever After officially opened in the Norway Pavilion. For better or worse, the track layout remained exactly the same, and many of the iconic moments from Maelstrom were simply given a Frozen overlay as opposed to a total reimagining. The glowing Odin's eye would become a shimmering castle. Much like the three-headed troll casting a spell, Anna would also cast a spell, sending visitors sailing backwards. And of course, the frozen version would also have guests soar down a waterfall. Now this may surprise you, but for once, as much as I do truly miss Maelstrom, I actually enjoy writing Frozen Ever After, and it pays enough homages to Maelstrom that I just can't join the I Hate Frozen Ride crowd. However, integrating fictional characters and locations into an aspect of the park that was always grounded in cultural authenticity is another matter entirely. Those of us who work with the Wonders of World Showcase each day might sometime tend to forget exactly what has been created here. So at the end of the day, though Maelstrom is gone, I actually don't know how to end this one. Um, oh, though it's much harder to see, you can still find traces of the original Denmark restrooms, and, uh, I really do miss Maelstrom. You know what I also miss? Classic shows and cartoons of the past, but with Verve, you now have access to Nick Splat and Boomerang. But Verve has way more to offer than just classic cartoons, and is now premiering the anticipated brand new series, Genlock. Featuring the voices of Michael B. Jordan, Dakota Fanning, Maisie Williams, and many more, the story follows a team of young pilots in a dystopian future, fighting to save the world and each other. Just go to vrv.co slash yesterworld, or click on the link in the description to sign up for a free 30-day trial of Verve Premium today. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and check out what other content's on the channel, and I'll see you next time on Yesterworld.